A chemical engineer with emotional intelligence, depression from the age of six, and how everything's possible. All this and more right now. The Remarkable People Podcast. Check it out. The Remarkable People Podcast. Listen. Do. Repeat. For life. The Remarkable People Podcast. Hello, friend. Welcome to this week's episode of the Remarkable People Podcast, the Christelle Pilo story. This week, you're going to hear from Christelle, and she's going to go through her life, how she journeyed from someone who started battling with depression at age six, worked through her life, was a chemical engineer, and had a major life and emotional shift and professional shift at 35. And now she's finally living her purpose with passion. She breaks down the steps, her highs, her lows, her everything in between into practical steps of how she did it so you and I can too. So check out this great episode of the podcast and reach out to Cristal, myself, and we want to help you any way we can. Also, there's a special mid-episode break that we take to talk about one of our former guests, David Mike, what he's going through in his life and how you can help. So I'm David Pasqualone. Check out this remarkable episode now, and we can't wait to hear from you soon. Enjoy. Hey, Christelle, how are you today? I'm fine. Thank you. I'm really, really happy to be with you today because we had this discussion a long time ago. It's like, yeah, it's happening. It's today. I know. I'm so excited for our meeting as well. And our listeners have heard this many times before, but Christelle has waited nine months right around there, correct? Yeah, something like that. It's definitely, it was, it was like winter and I can't remember. <laughs> Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that God loves you. We love you. And Christelle, she loves you. She's been waiting nine months to get on the show to share her story and insights and wisdom with you, which you're about to hear just to benefit your life. We're not getting paid for this. We're not trying to be rich and famous. We're just trying to give back. We've been blessed. You're blessed. Christelle's blessed. And we're just trying to share the love and become better humans. Right? So I Christelle, agree. We know you're going to bring us gold. We're going to hear your life stories, the highs, the lows, the everything in between. But if our listeners were going to get one truth that you're like, if you listen to this episode, you will walk away with this knowledge to apply to your life and be a better person. What would that one message be? Hmm. Ah, the, the question. Um, well, I, I just uh, wrote a, a book with, a co-wrote a book with a bunch of of ladies and I believe that what is really important to it's to give our brain stability and clarity and when we have stability and clarity then it's easier for us to take the right actions and when we take the right actions then we can feel more fulfilled and happier and I believe it's the sense of our life to have this feeling it's not necessarily easy I believe it's even it's not easy at all to find or to follow our um, what we think is right to do. And I believe we can follow that only when we have this clarity of mind, when we know, oh, I, I should do that and I know. And the stability, the, the emotional stability in order to go through it and to be stable enough, emotional, emo emotionally enough, stable enough in order to go through the process. Yeah. And that's so important because we can know everything. But if we don't apply it, it means nothing, right? Yeah, definitely. It's just dreams. Just It's just thoughts. It's nice, but it's not real. Yeah. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, you've heard it. You know a little bit of what to expect. So mm -hmm. at this time, let's go through your story because something or many things have happened to make you the woman you are today, Christophe. So let's start off. What was your upbringing like? Were you one of many children? Were you an only child? Were you born in a nursing home, an orphanage, whatever it was? Let's just <laughs> go through your life and your story. Okay. So as I told you, I just wrote a co-wrote a book and it was one chapter about my life. 
But I started with 35 years old because something, it was kind of my rebirth as I was 35 years old. So should I start with 35 or should I start even earlier, like five years old? Yeah, no, just go, just give a quick overview. Like, you know, okay. like I was born, my mother my had father. me, we were raised outside of Boston, had no brothers or, you know, just whatever it is, just give a quick <laughs> okay. overview of your life. So people know the base and foundation mm -hmm. you're coming from. So um, I am the smallest one of, I have two siblings, two brothers, they are older than I am. And I was, so my, my parents didn't really wanted me to come or to be, it was a little bit early. So they just were, were tired, but just, just arrived. And I was a surprise because I was a girl and not a boy as they thought. So it was a good surprise at the end. Uh, and my life was a very, very nice life, like in France. I am French. We can hear that. Um, until I was six years old. So like having a lot of time outside, just having the freedom that I wanted to have and enjoying life as much as I could as a five years old or and so on. I believe my first law was as I was six years old and I did my kind of first depression and that happened because in my family, we are kind of good to use our both hands. So at that time, I wrote uh, with my left hand and I used to draw or do something with my right hand. And as a teacher, I have seen that. So they decided to switch and they decided to force me to write with, with my um, right hand because it's easier in our world. Um, and for some, for some children, it's really fine. It's not a problem, but for some children, it's very complicated to, uh, to deal with that. And in my case, it was really difficult to deal with that. So I had to train my hand during the summertime to, you know, to train a lot and to do a lot of lines in order to get used to, 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 to write with my right hand. And so my, my brain started to collapse more or less. So my brain couldn't really see what is the difference with right and left. And at some time I, like, I started to, to write like Leonardo da Vinci. So right, so the wrong direction and so on. So just the brain is completely knocked down. And it took me a few years to come back to normality. So that was with six years old. And it's maybe the time I learned my first lesson, which was, yeah. No, no, keep going. Keep going. Okay. The lesson that you learned. Yeah. Yeah. My first lesson was something like, well, adults should be there to protect you, but they are not there to protect you. And sometimes they are the one uh, putting you in difficulties. <laughs> they kind of like abandon you. And when you are different, it's not good to show it up because you are going to have trouble because of that. So it's good to stay non -see not seen. So to stay unknown and not seen and to stay in the group and never show your difference. So that was kind of the first lesson that I learned with six years old. And then, yeah, like you said, at that age, your mind is so pliable and it's forming and you're hoping and the good, the, the model is to have the adults protect you and help shape you in a positive way. So when all this is happening, you're actually feeling the stress and the instability at six. And you said for a few years, did you just grow out of it and become accustomed to it? Or did you find a path out? to deal with it? I think I had the luck, the luck to, so my parents, so the, the teacher at some point says, oh, okay, she, she, she is in big trouble. She has to go and see a shrink and she can now use the hand that she wants. I don't care anymore, but it was too late. And my parents told her, well, she's very clever. She's going to make it. And I believe that this belief, help me to 
believe it and to say, I'm going to make it. I'm going to find a way to calm down and to to concentrate again and to find the right path in my my brain again. So this this one belief that my parents had in myself, say, okay, she is clever, she has, she's tough, she's going, going to make it, really helped me a lot. And uh, yeah, I do believe that the the, the family values like yeah, never give up, always fight for what you want, stuff like that, just help me to to fight in order to come back in my normal intelligence level. So I can remember with six that every evening we spend a lot of time with my mom and then with my dad trying for me to to learn to read because reading was really difficult for me because the letter were all over the place and I couldn't really find the direction in which direction I should read and so on. So it was a lot of, yeah, a lot of training. And I believe that because of that and the year after, every year was a little bit better, a little bit better. And with like, in what we say, like four read or fifth, fifth read great I came back to okay one of the first of my classes and and being at the normal level that I thought I should have had at the beginning already yes so persistence I believe that it's really like values of my family persistence you are good enough whatever you do it's going to be fine stuff like that yeah now did you have a touch or do you know looking back are you dyslexic on or was it just the forcing because i know like my grandparents and generations before mine if you were left-handed in america i know it's culturally di culturally different everywhere but if you were left-handed in america they forced you to use your right you couldn't you know they didn't they're you're stupid if you use your left so is that what messed your brain up with reading or did you also have dyslexia on top of it so it's diff it's a difficult question. I believe that I have a slightly dyslexia. My grandmother had one, so I do believe that it's something part of my family too. Uh, I can see my with my smallest boy right now. So he has this kind of um, using both hands. We don't know exactly what it is. If it's more uh, using left or right hand. Um, and I can see that he needs more concentration to put the ladder in the right direction as well. If it's dyslexia, if it's links all together, I don't know exactly. It's difficult to know. And at the end, the, the teacher and people, they don't really know about it. It's not something that they are aware of what it is. At like 20 or like 40 years ago, they didn't know much. And to be honest, right now, they don't know much more. It's still like, you know, we, we don't force anymore. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. It's good. But the level of um, knowledge and in, in, in understanding what's going on, it's not there. Yeah, I've me personally, I know, and probably you might, relate to this or maybe not, but I thought I was functionally retarded until I was in after college and I found out that I was dyslexic. So the, I, there was no tools, like you said, dyslexia is 50 years ago, dyslexia today, dyslexia in between. There wasn't really any, Hey, do this to fix it. But just knowing I had it, yeah. it gave me the mental fortitude to say, okay, doesn't matter if you have it or not. You just got to put more time in and, and work through it. So while everybody else studied half an hour, it might take me three hours. But I it gave me the mental fortitude to say there's nothing wrong with you. You're not stupid. You just got to retrain your brain. So is yes. that kind of how you were and you're working with your son? Yes, I, I believe that there is different level of dyslexia. I believe that for some uh, some of us, uh, dyslexia is so, so uh, strong that it's really difficult to go into um, the, the reading. In my case, like the case of my son, it's just need a lot of concentration. So I can feel right now that when I am a little bit tired when I am a little bit stressed out and so on. So I don't really write what I 
want to write. So something happens. And with the different languages as well, on top of that, it's like, oh my God, that like today I have done that. It's, oh, that's strange because I thought something in English and I think I wrote something in French. It was, what is going on? So it's completely <laughs> like dissociated in my mind. So in my case, I know that I have to put more concentration in order to write things properly. And I believe that it's the case for depending on the language as well, like English and French, this, this kind of language, they are not transparent. So we really have to take to, to, to put our attention in how we write things, because what we write is not necessarily what we hear. Some other language like German, because I speak German, it's all like Spanish. It's really like what you hear, it's something, it's what you write down. So there is less dyslexia problem in this kind of languages. So that's why I know that concentration, so to have the right attention, to put our attention where we want it to be is very, very important. And because in my case, it was so important as I was a child. I learned that quickly <laughs> that I have to I had to concentrate myself. I can see that with my son. And I believe anyway, I believe that concentration is so important. There is so many children right now having this concentration deficit. They they don't know anymore how to put the right attention at what they do. And it's where yeah, a lot of things doesn't work anymore anyway, even if they don't have dyslexia. So somebody's listening. We have people listening all over the world right now, right? We have a great <laughs> community, but there's people listening, men and women from all different countries. And they're like, I felt this way growing up or, Hey, my kid's struggling with this. Mm -hmm. What tips do you have that you found work for you and maybe for your son that you'd be like, Hey, this is something to help with concentration. This is something to help with focus. What's helped you to overcome that obstacle? Okay, so for me, and it's what I teach even even today. It's what I teach to children. It's it's really training our concentration. And one way to train our concentration is meditation, mind, yeah, mindfulness. Um, because meditation is really like the gym for our brain. And with meditation, very simple meditation, just with the breath help us to understand where our brain, our thoughts and our emotion lead us. And that help us to better understand I am concentrated right now or I am not. And therefore, every time we can, we can feel the switch in our brain so we can ask our brain to come back to the reading or the writing or whatever we want to concentrate on. So I would really definitely suggest people to, to train the concentration in one way is definitely mindfulness and meditation, but I would as well. And it's really what I suggest people to do the, my, my small client or my big clients to, um, to, 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 to be self-confident it's exactly what you said before like okay maybe i have like this weakness weakness is there so i'm not so so strong there but there is so many other things i am so good at it so it's just the way i am is the right way i am good i am enough and i just need a little bit of concentration there but i'm going to make it so it's really like to have the reassurance that everything is fine and to, to try to decrease the stress because children with dyslexia usually and other special needs, usually they are really stressed out. They are stressed out because they don't have the results they would like to have. They put a lot of effort. Sometimes the, the, the friends and, and the, um, the children around, they don't really understand. So they are not really kind. Sometimes even the adults, they are not really kind. Or even if they understand, sometimes they don't just... They don't have enough time or they don't have enough uh, passions to to help and they don't just don't react the right way. So at the end, these children are stressed out and they feel kind of different, which is not a nice feeling. And they 
they are tired. So I would suggest train the concentration, help them to feel good about them, find an activity where they can really excel and be, be, be strong and just yeah, the stress, decrease the stress that they can have. Oh yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, anybody in any scenario, stress is like adding gasoline to a fire. Yes, and exactly. when you have a child who's struggling, it's like taking the hose where f information can flow and stress just shrinks that and it just makes yeah. it harder and harder. So I couldn't agree with you more to try to reduce the stress. That doesn't mean we yeah, can't have and, pressure on life. Exactly. And when we are stressed out, so our concentration capability, it just goes down. So everything is even more complicated. Our memory is not working as well. So that it's really not helping at all. So it's really, how can I decrease the stress of my child or my own stress? How can I help him to feel good and self-confident? And how can I train his brain in order to stay concentrated and resilient and go through the task? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And then we also, I mean, pressure's good, stress is bad, right? There's a difference. Like if you have pressure makes diamonds, stress kills you. But I'm not saying in any way, shape and form, and I don't think you are, you know, be a snowflake. Just, oh, don't put any stress or responsibilities on these kids or don't make them work hard. That's not what you or I are saying. We need to teach them that they can take a lot of pressure. They can take a lot of, you know, responsibility in life and still perform without being crushed but you got to start baby steps is that yes. how you understand it too yeah yeah definitely so i do believe that it's even more productive so if you ask your children or if you push a little bit your children up or press them or put a little bit of pressure so they are going to understand that they can handle it that they can they can do something with it and then they are going to to feel even uh, like stronger and uh, feel good about them and i know that for my children i give them a lot of responsibility i have three children and i give them a lot of responsibility even a four years old had so they are a little bit older now but a four, four year old had responsibility because he's part of the team and and then they have the confidence that they they can give support to their parents, that they they can give something, and then they feel good about it, and that helps for the self confidence. So I think pushing our children, putting a little bit of pressure, it doesn't have to be always only at school, but a little bit everywhere. Letting them understand that they are part of the team at home, part of the family. They are not just a something that we have to take care of, but they can take care of their own parents and siblings and so on. They love it. So I know yeah. that my little one is like, oh my God, I can do that. I can do that. And do, like during the COVID and the lockdown. So I had so many things to do. And my, my last one was five years old. And I told him, okay, so for the family today, you have to do that and that and that and that. And at the end of the day, I told him, hey, I could do my work. Because of you, because you are so great, because you help us out, and because, be, yeah, because you, you are part of the team, and was so proud, like just growing a little bit more, and like, oh my god, I'm so cool. <laughs> yeah, and that's so important because you're teaching people that no one does it all on their own. We all have God, we have each other, and you all work together, and yeah. you do what you can do with the abilities and tools you have. That's great. You're raising your kids in that family tight team environment because that's what we need in the world definitely yeah and i believe that a leader or we always say that as well that if you want to have success it's not okay it's, you are not going to have it alone so you need your your people your need and it starts with the family and i know that women we tend to try to do everything by ourselves we tend to try to be the center of the family, but there is other ways. And I know that this, so I have three boys and my husband, so I have the, I am the only girl in the family, but as when I'm traveling, they are doing it perfectly without me, not the way that I'm doing it. So they, my husband is different. So he does his own way, but it's working exactly as well as when I am here and he's away. 
And I like that. I love the fact that without me, they are just great. They don't feel alone. Beautiful. So let's go back and pick up in your childhood. I don't want to skip anything and I don't want you to feel like you have to spend time. So we we got you growing up. You're being forced to use your right hand. It's kind of disconnecting your brain. You're having struggles with that. Now you're about 10 years old. You, that psychologist has some confidence in you. It gives you confidence in yourself. And now you start growing. Where does your life go from there? So I know that with 10, 12, I wanted to go. I, I grew up in a small village in France. So I just wanted to go away. It was kind of too boring. Or I kind of wanted to see if somewhere else it was better. Or I, I don't know. I just wanted to go away. My father could find a job in Africa. So I was like, well, we are going to go to Africa. But that's, it didn't work out. So he went two years in Africa and I had to stay at home. So it was really painful. And then I moved to a bigger city for college and so on. I found this year a little bit complicated. Somehow teenager time, eventually having some problem with like how to say that food and so on. How to say that? Hospitality, this, like food and beverage? Um, no, it's just, just with food. Not the rest, but like eating too, yeah, eating too much or too less or too whatever. So, and and finding difficult to to have the right to find my place in 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 this world. I was in a college where maybe ninety five percent of the people were boys, and and only a few girls were there. So maybe it was as well a little bit difficult to find the right way of being. And everything what I wanted to do didn't really work out. I wanted to, um, to be more into the creative way and drawing and so on didn't work out. I wanted to be like sport teacher didn't work out. Then maybe I wanted to be psychologist, but it didn't really work out neither. So I just became a chemical engineer. Easy path, easy path. We'll just do chemical engineering. Yeah, I I find it very boring. But at the same point, it was my way out because as a chemical, as I studied chemical engineering, I could travel around. I could study a little bit in England, a little bit in, in Germany, and my last internship was in China. So it's really what helped me to go through the process and to think, okay, so I mean, you, you always can somehow find interest in what you study. I am kind of a learner. So at some point you say, okay, if I concentrate myself and find the interesting point, I'm going to find them. So it's what I have done. And because I could travel, was good. It was good enough. So I became Beautiful. an engineer. And then how long did you enjoy the engineering when you were practically and doing it? Or was it something you got bored in the career? How did that go for you? As I came back from China, a French company um, asked me to develop the German market for them in chromatography so something that i didn't really know what it was at the at that moment and i just say okay why not it was very challenging i was 24 i had to move alone in germany i had to find the clients because we didn't have any kind of client and at that time we had okay we had internet but that's it so we didn't have any kind of whatsapp or kind of communication or, or even how to uh, gps so we didn't have that so it was very challenging and what i remember it was really funny because i had to i had to introduce me to the german researcher in pharmaceutical and chemical field as an expert i was 24 my german was not that good and i had no clue about chromatography and for german people it's not really possible to be 
engineer with 24. And for German people, so French people are very good with wine and, and perfume and, and baguettes, but not really with chemistry. So they are the giant in Europe, in Europe about chemistry. So it was really difficult to have the acceptance of the people over there. And that was challenging. So that I really thought that I would never achieve it. And I believe that this challenge helped me to stay a while in the company because at some point it worked out. I found the client and, um, and, and I worked hard in order to understand better the technique that I was selling. Yeah. And then I moved to international sales and that was another challenge uh, that helped me to, to, again, to travel a lot, to understand other nationalities or the kind of other ways of thinking. So like in India, they think completely differently about business and how we treat people or in Brazil and so on. So it was really, really interesting. Yeah. So I have done that until I was 35. Beautiful. And then as you're traveling and you're seeing different cultures and different customs and just a different way of thinking, like you said, people are people and the core of a human is the core of a human. Everybody wants to feel love, to be understood, yeah. to feel special, but the way they go about that in their daily life is completely different at times, it seems, right? So yes. as a woman in chemical engineering, traveling abroad, what was that like on a daily basis and how did you make it work? Because I'm sure there's cultures that didn't embrace you totally. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I, I think, so I live in Germany. So, and that's the first thing between Germany and, and France. Well, it's Europe. So there is so many things that are kind of the same, but at the same time, in Germany, they see the, a, a woman, when she has children, has another kind of place in the society than in France, in Germany. So I believe that it was maybe my first fight. So because I am like a typical French woman having three children, so it's so typical that French women have three children. We don't have all three children, but in Germany, it's kind of never happened that they have three children. And in France, like having three children, working full time, it's kind of normal. So, so many people do, do that. But in Germany, it's not the case. And it's not well seen. They don't like it. And, and sometimes they can show it to you that it's not okay. And even the society is not made in order for you as a woman to work full time and have children. So it's a little bit more challenging. So I believe that it was maybe my first career or my first battle. And abroad, it's a little bit different. I believe that like in, in, in India or in China, they accept, even if you are a woman or in Japan, or even if you are a woman, they accept you because you are European and they know that it's different. And therefore, usually it's okay. They accept you. Yeah. They, they just do a difference between you as a European woman doing business and they are our, our wife. They do a difference, gotcha. which is at the beginning, I was like, okay, it's fine. I understand it's their culture and I'm really very open and empathic and so on. So I always try to to adapt. I always try to adapt because I learned that I was six years old. It's better to try to adapt than to, to force things. But after a while, I was a little bit upset about that. Like, because when you see, I have a, I, I can remember I had a meeting with one of my partner in India and his wife, and it was dinner and we had a very nice dinner and I ordered some wine or beer and and the wife was there and she wanted to have one but she couldn't have one because it's not okay to drink for a wife over there 
And she told me that sometimes when she's in London al alone, she does that. But in India, it's just not okay. And I was, I was really upset. She like, you are free. You can do whatever you want. But over there, it's not the case. And during a while, I was like, I don't want to apologize for that. Or I don't want to accept that just because it's their culture. Like, because I do believe that one person, wherever is she, this person should be free and drink wine or beer or juice or water, whatever she wants, when she wants it. Yeah. And I can understand that it's because there's so many different cultural things and some things are from a religious background. Some things are from just, this is how we've done it for 6,000 years. So that would be hard to watch if it's something you don't agree with. Yeah. And now you said you're around 35 years old in, in this timeline, but you also said at the beginning of the podcast, you kind of had a rebirth at 35. So between your birth and 35, is there anything significant in your life that we missed or that you want to cover before we transition to 35 moving forward to today? Um, maybe there is one thing that we didn't speak about, and it's the fact that in the time where I learned my lesson about me and that it's better to to be in the group and not not show something else and so on. So my my parents started to to build their own business and they did everything at home. So during the day they had their own yeah, our own work and so on. And during the evening, they started to build their own business. And as a six, seven, eight years old, I can remember that at that moment, it was so joyful. It was so, so it's always like had excitement pure at home because they had their partner coming over and we had dinner with these guys or women coming and they are they were all excited about what they were building and so on. And I, I remember I couldn't really understand a lot about their business, but all what I can remember is the energy, the energy that created at home. It was like, yeah, passion. And I can remember that that's, so that I understand what, what is passion at that moment. And my parents have done a lot of personal development with that, because when you have your passion and what it's what we, we discussed earlier, that when you have the clarity, the passion, where you want to go, then you have to have the stability to, in your mind, to go out of your comfort zone, because you are going to do crazy things that you are not used to do. And and I could witness that with six, eight years old. And I found it was, yeah, it was so exciting. And with, as a teenager, I continued to go into this personal development seminars and so on. So I learned a lot. I started to, to read books about how to, this book, very, very well known, how to make a friend in, not in 10 days, but. I don't remember the, the title of it. Bill and Carnegie? I, yes, Bill exactly. Carnegie, How to Win Friends yeah. and Influence People. Yes, exactly. And I, 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 I read this book with 17 because I was kind of tough and not smiling much and so on. And people always told me, oh, you, you are a very nice girl, but when we don't know you, you, you seem so arrogant and not nice at all. And so I, I, I read this book. And I started to, during the summertime, I was starting to use it, just smile. Like when you, when you meet someone, before you meet this person, like one meter away, you start and smile. And I have seen the difference. It's just amazing. So, and I always try to read this kind of book and, and, and really try them, try the, the techniques in the book. And I loved it because I could see results. So, and that continued to follow me even during the years as an engineer, every time I had a challenge, meditation, I learned my first meditation with eight years old, and that was really astonishing for me. And that always, it was, it, it, it always have been part of my life. And every challenge I could go through it because of that. Awesome. Yes. And that book has changed so many people's lives and you can take all the principles in it 
from smiling and the person's first name and the yes. way to put other people before you. You can tie all that back to the Bible. I mean, I love that. Even when I taught at a college, I tell the students, I'm like, if you can read this book, it can change your life because all the truth comes from the Bible, even though the author doesn't necessarily, he admits he doesn't trust God as a savior, but he says over and over in the book how so many times he quotes the Bible and it's right, right? So yeah. it's mind blowing, but that book is a fantastic book. So let's do this. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a short break and we come back. Christelle is going to teach us and move forward with her life from 35 forward to today. And we will be right back in just a moment. Hey, friends, welcome to the special break of the Remarkable People podcast. I know we don't normally do this, but this is an exception and you're going to want to be part of it. What we're going to do today is we're going to pray for our friend, David Mike. He was in season seven, episode 704, and he's the gentleman that was not only a longtime listener of the podcast, but then he became a guest and referred to other guests to our show. And he's just an inspiring human, as you can see in his book, Dishonor, or as you'll hear in our podcast episode together, where he shares his life story and just how crazy some of the moments in his life have been. Since the show, David and I have stayed in touch lightly. I follow him on social media. He's always doing fundraisers and reaching out to help people and doing rucksack challenges. And he really is just a remarkable human trying to make the world a better place. But right now he needs our help. So I don't know all the details and I'm not sure what he wants me or doesn't want me to share publicly, but he has a form of cancer. And he said that I can share this with you. It's in his head and neck area. And it's supposed to be a lesser form of cancer, meaning it's not as aggressive and it's typically treatable. But as you and I know, we don't want to take anything for granted. We don't want to take anything lightly. And we want to go to the throne of grace for our brother. So what I want to do at this time is just ask you to you know check out David's episode, check out his books. You can see what kind of human he is. Check out his social media. But if you can right now and you know maybe in your prayer life, until you hear he's better, or maybe just once, or maybe five times. There's no formula, but if it's from your heart, if you can pray for our brother, David Mike, to have a full healing, that would be fantastic. Because right now he's looking at radiation therapy, and that is no fun. There's a lot of pain, especially when it's in the neck region, because you get sores in your throat, it's hard to swallow. And David is a fit dude, and he doesn't have a lot of body fat. So let's pray he porks up if he's got to go through radiation, has enough weight that he can lose, and that doesn't get him any trouble, okay? So again, I thank you for being part of our show and our community. This isn't something we've ever done before. I don't know if we'll do it again. But right now we have a brother in need and there's nothing we can do but to go to God and ask him for his help. And God will do whatever is in his will and whatever's in his will, whether it's healing David fully, taking him home or something in between, everything will be the biggest blessing for David, his family, and me and you in eternity. We may not understand it now, but it really always will work out in the end for God's glory and our benefit. So I just want to say a quick prayer and then we'll be getting back to our episode with Cristal. Abba, we love you and you are good. And we have no power or strength, but we have your love and we have your promises. And please help our brother David now. Help him emotionally, spiritually, physically, in all ways, just to know you love him. And for whatever reason this is happening, help him to trust and rest in you. Help his faith to be increased, the faith of those watching. And God, you know, as men, we want a full recovery for David. And I pray that, please, Father, knowing that your will will always be done. But for our listeners going through something physical, emotional, family, financial, whatever it is, for David, for all of our families, God, we just ask for your grace and peace that we always put you first and we rest assured that you will take care of us. But as a brother in Christ who loves David, please help him now. Give him comfort, give him healing, and help him to get through this and become more passionate and more on fire for you, more in love with you than ever before. To you be the glory and power forever, Lord. Amen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, 
I probably can't pray as eloquent as you can, but it's just us and God talking. So go, say your prayer for David, lift him up to the throne of grace, and uh, let's keep track and let's see what happens. But no matter what, let David know he's loved. I'll put links in the show notes again. You can reach out to him via email or social media. You can also go ahead and check out his episode 704, and you'll see just what an amazing human he is. So that's it. I'm David Pasqualone with the Remarkable People Podcast, praying for our brother, David Mike. And let's get back to the Cristal story now. Hey, Cristal, welcome back. Yeah, we are back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let's do this now. We just heard your first 35 years, took a short break. And now we're back to hear from 35 through today. So where is your journey? Like you said, there's a massive life change and shift. Tell us about that. Yes, I said it was kind of my rebirth. I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to, to share that as well as in the book, but you can, the book is going to come in, in November out. So I am going to share the, this story that I'm going to, to share with you right now. And there is seven other stories, inspiring stories of great ladies as well. So what happened is that I had this dream job traveling around trying to extend the business of my company. I had already two small children. They were like nine months old and the other was like three year old. So really small children. And I explained to my husband, I, w I really want to take this job. Because as I told you, so in French, it's normal to when you have like an opportunity, you just take it, even if you are a mom. And for me, it was clear that I wanted to try it. I wanted to to yeah to take this opportunity and to do something with it and in my in my mind it always it's better to go forward and if it's not the right path then you change but not to take on an opportunity because you believe it's going to be difficult it's something that i cannot really understand so that's why i explained my husband we are going to do that and if it's not working we can I don't know. I can change. I can do something else. Everything is open. And so I started to travel around and, and it was nice, but at the same time, I felt really empty and, and it's something that was already present before. I can remember with 70, 27, I told my, my, my mom, you know, I'm doing this job but it's just because I have nothing else to do. And yeah, again, I can travel and it's fine enough and I can grow and learn. So it's okay, it's enough, but I didn't really felt very inspired. And the program with the, the company I was working with, but I do believe that is the program with so many companies that my goal was to just make more money and nothing else than that. So I was like a cash machine for my company, trying to develop business and do more money. And uh, for me, it was not fulfilling enough. And I had this depression every year, more or less, uh, where I found I have no energy left to do these kind of things. I just want to stay in my bed and and I don't understand why I'm doing that and so on. And with 35, I had this kind of depression, but deeper. And it was really intensive. And at that moment, I told myself, okay, I, I don't know how to come out from this one. And it's interesting because... With 30, I had already like a therapy and we, because of my depression already and, and I wanted to get rid of it. And I always have been in personal development and I always have been meditating. So I become a master in stabilize my mind. So stability of my mind where was there, but what I discovered with 35, with this one deep depression is that the clarity of my mind wasn't there. I had no clue what to do on this earth. And this question always came back to me. 
like what I'm doing here. What is the purpose of all that? It's so much energy to try to face everything, like the job, my children, and everything. And all, always the question coming back, why am I doing that? What is the purpose of all that? And that drove me crazy somehow. And I had kind of a wake-up call with 35. And that's why I say that it was my rebirth. And my wake up call was that I lost a baby. So I did a miscarriage. And my mind was like very stable again, like it's okay, it's normal, it's nature, everything is fine. But still, I felt so empty. And then until I realized that I was using this baby to try and change my life again, try to find solutions. And at the moment I realized that I was using a baby and that's why I was sad because I had this, this solution was gone as the baby didn't decide, didn't, didn't to come to, to, to the world. I felt like, wow, what kind of person I am to use a baby to just because I, I don't know, I'm not. I am too core to, to change things by myself. I have to use like a, a little human being. And that was my wake up call. That's and, good. Now, oh, go ahead. I'm, there's a delay between us. So I apologize. What were you saying? No, it, that that's it. So it's why I believe that we all have that more or less that we sometimes feel something that's not okay and be, maybe because we don't have the clarity we use a person a thing a, con a, a second a circumstance in order not to do the right step but i believe that if we have the chance to get the clarity and then to do the right thing um that it's the best way to live our life. And at that moment where I decided, I, I realized that I thought, okay, for this baby, I decide not to come to the world. And for the two children that I have already here, because anyway, I was, I was not a fun mom at that time. I was depressed. I was tired. I was angry. So I was not fun. I was not fun for my husband neither. He told me, so you don't have your sense of humor anymore. So it was just, I, I was anyway, I was already losing everything. So I was not a good mom. I was not, a, it, the, the partnership with my husband wasn't working anymore. I was not good at work anymore. So everything was like going away. Nobody could see that, only me, because I was very good at, at playing the game, but I could feel that. And yeah, so I was losing everything already. At that moment, so I have seen that, I thought, okay, for my children, for the one who decided not to come, I have to change that. And for all the people that maybe doesn't have the same chance that I have, that's, so I can do that, so I should do it. So I decided to and change. Now you you said you started feeling depressed and struggling with depression at six years old, correct? Yeah. And so this was a consistent, I think you mentioned almost like annual, it flared up once a year, but was it just pretty much there throughout your life and it flared up at times? Yeah, I think so. My first depression, I think it was really with six years old. And then with, I, I don't know, maybe with like teenager time, I always had this kind of episode anymore, uh, again and again and again. It's difficult to say how present it was because again, in my family, it's like you have to be strong. And, and during a while, I really tried to suppress my emotion because I thought if emotions are so difficult to bear, maybe if I suppress them, it's going to be easier. So maybe with 17, with all the books that I, I learned and meditation, and so somehow I try to suppress the emotions. But yeah, it comes back. 
and if you try to suppress it it comes even stronger back and that's why yeah. I believe that I had like this this moment like okay I can't anymore it's too much it's too much so it was like standing in the morning was really difficult or maybe I could do that but and I could work properly during a few hours and then I crashed so it was my we all are different I believe but in my case it was sleeping all the time yeah and eating sleeping eating sleeping eating <laughs> so yeah no yeah. I find it interesting because so in my experience personally studies i got a master's degree in this and just observing and having the privilege to talk to so many people it's interesting because normally people at a young age who start suffering with depression there's some kind of catalyst whether it's emotional abuse physical abuse sexual abuse some kind of tragic loss or something that puts them in this cycle and then they don't have the skills to deal with it. I mean, most adults these days, sadly, don't have conflict skills, right? Conflict resolution yes. skills. Mm -hmm. So children have this trauma and it carries with them. And like you said, if we don't have a purpose or a clarity of vision and we don't know what our existence is, why did God put us here? We try to fill it. Some people fill it with food. Some people fill it with drugs. Some people fill it with, you know, sex. Some people fill it with all different things. But if you yes. have a hole, you're going to keep filling it. You have temporary happiness, but the long-term joy is gone. Yeah. So it's super interesting to me. There was nothing in your first six years that was traumatic, or at least nothing you mentioned, to put you into this cycle other than the stress of you know, I'm being told to use my right hand, but I, I'm by my left. It, was there anything else that happened to set you off in that pattern or was that it? Yeah, I think it was it. So I really try to search a lot and to try to find if something else were present or not. Um, I think it, it was definitely one key or one parameter of it. And so now I can speak about it without problem. But maybe like 10 years ago, I can remember that one, I explained that my husband and I was crying. I was 30, 32. And I explained what happened as I was six years old. And I couldn't explain that without crying, collapsing again, like what's going on? So it's, it's really crazy. All the emotion coming back. And that's really interesting because you're again, so your rational mind thing, everything is fine. It's just ahead things and now i can play with both so i can write with both hands and so on so i can do my show and so your rational mind tells you everything is good so why are you crying but is, there is really like this six years old part of you who is not finished with this trauma and this part of you is still screaming and crying and telling you it's Maybe it's my fault because I did something at that moment or adults so like the abandoned trauma because I had the impression that every adults were against me. So these kind of things, I do believe that it was a huge part of my, my unease or how I felt within and maybe there is some other past trauma coming from my mother's side. Uh, because her childhood was not really very lovely and uh, um, my grandmother neither and maybe somehow um, they could pass that through yeah through behavior or things like that mm -hmm. um, yeah so I maybe it's something like that as well uh, but I believe that you need to have eventually one point where indeed, so there is like the catalysm, so the things that uh, that opened the door, and eventually that was it. That was this um, this story as I was six years old because I don't see any any other stories. Yeah. Well, let's talk about when you're 35 because so many people are tortured for years and they have this inner struggle and they feel terrible and their joy is sucked from their lives. But yet when you bring the truth into the light, it can be literally poof, seconds and all the bad goes away and you can just move forward. All the weights 
are taken off. All the pain is left behind. So what happened and how did you do that at 35 where you're like, I'm turning in, I'm facing this, I'm taking care of it and I'm moving forward? Yeah, I believe that as I have seen that, because as I was like 31 or something like that, I explained my husband, oh, maybe I should learn psychology again. So trying already to change a little bit and find something that's, that inspire me more. And then he told me, no, it's not a good idea. So I said, okay, it's not a good idea. So maybe I'm going to do like an MBA because it was like the logical step where everyone would wait for me to take this step. But I wasn't really motivated to do any kind of MBA. So I stopped doing the, the process. And with 35, with the baby, uh, the, the dead baby and so on, I really at that moment, so, okay, I don't, I don't care anymore. I don't want to fit anymore in what other people think is good for me. And I think it was my revelation. I think it was like, okay, now I am not asking for approval anymore. I'm just taking what I think is what I need for my life. And I believe that I had this strength because of the children, because I thought if I, if I am not courageous enough to like take my destiny and do what I think is best for me and, and, and feel fulfilled and fight for my happiness. How am I going to teach that my children? It's not possible. And I am kind of integral person. So when I say something, I mean it, it's not possible for me to say something and do the contrary consciously at least. <laughs> so, so I knew at that moment, so as I w woke up, that I couldn't teach that to my children if I stood in this kind of empty job. And then as a mom and as a person with values, so it was just not possible to do differently. And, uh, and yeah, it was like a wake, like a rebirth because at that moment, okay, I know that psychology is my strength. I know that coaching is just great things. I had that during my, my, like my childhood, having so many coach around and I love the energy and I love what it make with people. So I, so my, some, somehow I knew that it was my calling. So I just had to do it. So I decided to do it. And then where does your life go from there? Once you made that decision, where's your life go, Christelle? It was, well, it was not easy because I had always like these two small children. I still had my job. I had to pay my bill. My husband didn't want me to change anything. And he was not really able to open up and to, to deal with me about that. So I felt really alone with my decision and in having the impression that I have, I had to fight against a lot of things, but again, so it's exactly what you said. So when you find it, so it's not empty anymore. There is something else inside. So like, there is like a kind of inner strength that push you in the right direction. And so it was really like step by step. So like, okay, I have to find a new job to work part time in order to, to, to build my business in the meantime, before that, during two years, I, I, learned, um, I had my, I had to learn uh, for my, uh, coaching certification. I had a third child coming up. So it was just step by step. And again, very disciplined, resilient, and doing, doing slowly, but surely. Yeah. It took me yeah, two years to have this. Okay. I was just going to say that. It, and it took you two years of discipline and people want the end result, but they don't want to do the work. So talk about the discipline. Like what were some what were some, I don't want to say safeguards, but what were some parameters you worked in your life? You're a, a wife, you're a mother, you're a businesswoman, you're starting a new career. You have all these things going on, but did you say no matter what, these actions will be taken each day? What was your daily schedule like? 
Um, yeah, so the, the first two years, just for my certification, so yeah, I had to learn about 10 hours a week. So I knew that I had to do that every day. And even if I was evening too tired and so on, I just, I just made it. That's it. And I, I can remember, so some days I was so tired. And so tomorrow, I said, no, no, no. If I say tomorrow, today, it's, it's over. So just do it now. So that's what the first two years. And then after that, it was, it was not easy. So I had like this part-time job, but still as engineer. And then I had to develop my business. So it was really, I had no free time at all. Now that I'm look, looking back, I don't know how, how I have done that. It, but you I don't did know. it. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope that listeners, for me, for you, for all of our community, take away from what Crystal is saying as just do it. You know, it's, it's all about, you know what you need to do and you might be exhausted and it might be sloppy. It might be ugly. I'm sure Christelle, many times you're like, this is not my best quality, <laughs> but you got it. You're right. But you got it done. It, it's, yeah. it's not about, you can pass with a C, get the C. If that's all you can get, get the C, but yeah. don't make excuses and don't push it off because it's just going to get harder the next day. And you said, you knew in your mind, if you didn't finish, you were finished. Like if you didn't get it done, you were going to quit. So I really respect you for saying that and being so transparent because for all of us, you know, it, if you win a fight and you come out perfect without a punch, hit landed on you, or if you're a bloody mess, you still won the fight. So sometimes you just got to get bloody, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I know that. And I am the first one speaking about work life balance. So my client comes to me in order to have that and so on. And I do believe that it's important to have it, but there is some moment in life. You just don't have the balance. <laughs> so it's just messy. And, but that's why I believe that it's important to, to be passionate. I, I really, I was definitely so, so enthusiastic about the things that I learned and, and the change that I had to go through the process. And it was really interesting. And sometimes I think about, so this, um, this singer or actor and so on, so during years and years and years, they continue to do the art that they do we, without being paid, without just for the sake of of uh, acting or singing or whatever they, they are doing because they just love it. They sometimes we say, so you, you, you know that you do the right thing when you do it without being paid and you enjoy doing it. And that is exactly what's happening. I mean, that I am not paid to be with you today. I just enjoy it. So I'm really happy to be there and to discuss about this because it's so interesting. And I wouldn't be so happy to discuss about chemistry and chromatography. I mean, I do believe it's interesting, but maybe for other people, but not for me. I can remember that sometime I had call as my, for my last job, like in India, they were they, they were having trouble with the machine. So, and I had to try to find solution for them to continue to work and so on. And it was sometimes Saturday morning and so on. And I was really upset about that. I was, I was empty just because I was burned because of this kind of calls. I didn't want to take this kind of calls. Now, if I have some client calling me during the weekend or evening or morning, I just take the call and I'm happy to do that. So it's just a complete different kind of energy. So that's why I believe that it's important to find our um, calling, our passion, uh, what we think is important for us to do, because that gives us another kind of energy. And then we do think that we, we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And I believe that what it's what happening happened. And now when I think back, oh my God, I, I really had... No time I woke up very so 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 often at four o'clock in the morning until late in trying to put everything under a, a day or a, um, a hat. We say that in German, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. So now where does your life go from here to today? Bring us up to where is Cristal today? And then we'll transition to where you're heading. How can we help you get there? Oh, nice. So I opened my coaching business 2015 or 16. At the beginning, I wasn't sure what kind of coach I wanted to be. So because of my meditation and mindfulness um, long activity, I started to teach people and children to be more mindful, to have this concentration. That's why I'm, I can speak about uh, special needs children because I have been in contact with so many of them and it's still happening. Um, in 2018, I quit my job as an engineer because I couldn't do any both anymore. So it was just too much. And then I thought, okay, I now I need to choose. So 2008... 2009, I stopped to be an engineer and I started to be a full-time coach. And 2021, I opened the um, um, Freedom Catcher Academy. And it's to help women to change career, to find a fulfilling career, to still have the profitable part. So earning money, because there is so many women thinking that it's okay not to earn money or if they go in the fulfillment, they are going to have less money, which is not necessarily true. So I help them to change career and to, to have the profit and to feel free and to have the right work-life balance if it's possible. And if it's not possible to go through the this this very intense moment and to be sure that if they have children or partners and so on, that they can still take care and have the right indicator to be sure that everything is fine. Beautiful. So, now, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to reach you? It, well, the best way is like my website. It's uh, Crystal Pillow or Pilot, depending on how you say that, dot com. LinkedIn, I'm very, very present on LinkedIn. My name again, Instagram. Yeah, it's like where you can find me. I'm always yeah. happy to discuss with you and to understand your stories. I love what you do because you really go deep into the stories of the people and it's where you can find the essence of humanity. Yeah, I mean, everybody has a journey and a story and it's just so good to share this time with you. And thank you. So. I got another, I probably have a thousand questions, but one more question I definitely want to ask, but between your birth and today, Cristal, is there anything we missed or anything significant that you want to share to encourage our community of listeners? And then from there, we're going to go, what's your next goal? Where are you heading next and how can we help you get there? So I don't think that we missed something what I really, really would like people to understand that it's there is something unique inside of us, like a very specific strength, specific way of thinking, specific talent. And I believe that when it's our our work, it's to to discover it and then to use it. And sometimes it's not so easy to discover it. But if you don't find it now, so it's okay. So you still have time to discover it, but but trust, trust that you have that inside. So that would be like something that I really would like people to understand. They have something unique. They are just unique. So it's just, I don't know. Every time I think about that, that we are so many on this earth, but we are all so different and so unique. So we are all diamond. But some of us, we don't see that. It's a pity. So I want people to understand that there are diamonds. Yeah. And that is so true. Everybody is special yeah. to God. Everybody has their own distinct purpose. And we're here to just enjoy the journey, glorify God, and help each other grow. Yeah. So speaking of growth, where are you going next? And how can we help you get there? What's your next goal? And how can we help you? My next goal, so my next goal is what I discovered. So I, I was kind of not a lonely 
child because I always had people around me, but like uh, doing my stuff alone and uh, trying to figure things out alone. And I discovered that when you find your tribe, when you find your people, so it's where magic happens. So now I am trying to find the right new tribe and the right new project. So right now I am working a lot with dancing school, not far away from me. They are just great. And we are trying to build things together a little bit yeah, bigger and nicer and with more impact. And I just so enjoy that. So my next step is finding the right people to work together and to do great things together. It can be a team, it can be a, a new business, it can be uh, like individual. I'm still working with individual, but it's really like more project-based and people-based. Beautiful. So we will put the links to your website and your LinkedIn all in the show notes. And we will, hopefully you will be able to build that community and people, your tribe can come together with some of our listeners. So ladies and gentlemen, reach out to Cristal ask questions, grow, take some of her coaching, whatever it is you need to do to find your distinct purpose in life and fulfill it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind, Crystal, I got one more question for you. And I love this word and it's inspiring to me, but a lot of people, they, they're broken by it because of the bad experiences in their life. And you use this word several times, possible. Mm. And, you know, you have impossible, you have possible, but the Bible says for with God, all things are possible. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Talked about being a base, it brought low and brought high and how no matter what with God, we can achieve because it's his calling and purpose. So when you think of the word possible, what does that mean to you? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, in, in the book, I write that as well. I say, I learned that everything is possible. But I believe that everything is possible. First of all, you have to be able to, to create the idea in your mind in order to, to go uh, where you want to be. If, you, if your uh, mindset is, is small, so your possible is going to be small because you, don't, you are not going to be able to create the right thought in order to go further. So that means that everything is possible, but it's in the, in the area of your, how much you can imagine or how much you can create in your mind. And the other thought that I had, like something like yesterday or the day before is that everything is possible. But sometimes when you really believe that you can, you can start to be anxious about the, fact that there is no limit and so often so we are more afraid about our power than about our lack of power so if you think that everything is possible so there is no limit anymore and I go oh my god oh my god there's so many things that we can do and then at that moment you can get like oh that's much so oh my god and then you can feel in my case it's exactly that I can feel like because of, I think it's because of the six years old that trying to fit in in the group and not being seen too much. So I have that coming back. No, 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 it's too dangerous, too dangerous. So when you say that, it's exactly what pops in my mind. Like everything is possible. It's just great. No limits. And like, oh my God, no limits. So I'm afraid about the power that I have inside of me. So I definitely think that it's one thing that I have to continue to work on. Yeah. And that's such uh, your statements when we really like dissect them and reverse engineer. It's powerful. We could do a whole episode just on the, <laughs> the philosophy of possible, right? Yes. Uh, maybe we should, we'll do it hanging out. But uh, thank you so much for being on the show today, Cristal. And ladies and gentlemen, Cristal just brought you a bunch of information, life experience. She brought you great advice and practical life tips. But like our slogan says, don't just listen to this great information. Do it, repeat it each day so you can have a great life in this world and most importantly, an eternity to come. So I'm David Pasqualone. This is our friend, Cristal, and it's not pilots. 
your name is Pilo, right? Yes, you're right. So we, we want to make sure we say your name right. So Cristal Pilo, and if you need anything, reach out to her through our website, through her LinkedIn. Cristal, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for being here today and being so patient after nine months. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me, having me with you. It was really, really nice. Oh, it, it was an honor. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, do what you heard, share it with your friends and family, even people you work with, you don't like, let's just make the world a better place. And we all get more joy and peace. We'll see you in the next episode. Ciao. The remarkable people podcast. Check it out. Remarkable People Podcast. Listen, do, repeat for life. The Remarkable People Podcast.